Good evening, everyone. Um, as you can hear, it's a busy time in the Kofman household. But uh, welcome to tonight's uh, Botanical Society webinar. It's the end of October already. Um, we've just had a good hot spell in the Cape, so spring is definitely over, beginning of summer. And um, this evening, we are going to look at our gardens. You would have noticed that it's been garden day, and um, we're, we're in that period of time when um, people are having uh, open gardens. Um, I know that there's one coming up in Stellenbosch and so Franschhoek and Elgin. So it's a time when people um, have primed their gardens to be ready, uh, which follows on from the big show down here in springtime. So to talk about our gardens today, we, um, we've got three incredible guests. And um, right now, I'm going to introduce the first one. So, Joy, if you could open up your, uh, well, put on your camera again, please, and um, share. Let's see. Um... Okay, just check my prompt there. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Yeah, awesome. so. I'd love to introduce Joy Paula. She's a um, an online friend of mine. <laughs> um, and uh, do yourself a favor and go check her out on Instagram. Um, she'll have the link at the end of the presentation. And um, I think our, our approach, we've spoken a lot about gardens this year at the Botanical Society, but it's definitely been um, more from a, what kind of plants that we use, quite a naturalistic space but um i think what uh, joy brings i mean she brings a lots of things uh but what she brings to this this evening's talk is just um talking about uh, how to look at limited spaces and uh from a kind of more design point of view so i see you start to share joy i'm gonna um go away <laughs> <laughs> and um and you can share with our audience um, what they need uh, oh sorry for housekeeping purposes everyone um i'm going to enable the chat so you can um see you can tell us where you're coming in from um and if you also want to um ask questions put them in the q and a we will deal with questions after each presenter not during joy um it's it's still giving me a black screen here is it so, uh, yeah. let's see uh, okay i can see your screen now <laughs> can you see my screen now yeah. let's let me just see if we can't um, maximize it. My apologies. No worries. Let's do a full screen. Perfect. How's that? Taking a couple of seconds to show my side. Is it still not showing? Hmm. Do you have... Um... Let me try... Um, I wonder, okay, so that's that. I'm gonna go back here and see if that works. Oh, it seems to be cutting off. You know what I'm gonna do? Can you give me two seconds? Sure. And... I'm just going to sort out a quick PDF situation. Yeah. Um, cool. And then I think that might be better because presenting directly from here seems to be the issue. No worries. Um, and while we're at it, um, I'm going to also later on be sharing some things from the Botanical Society team. Um, Specifically, those of you who are in the Eastern Cape, you're in for a treat, but uh, we'll we'll give more details right at the end there. Um, okay, we've got Pumalanga, Cape Town, Somerset West, Bergfleet, 
Um, we're doing good, yeah. <laughs> Oh, now spread. So they're all people from up country. Almost there. Uh Okay, I think. Yeah, I can see it now. Be good to go. Okay. Cool, thank you. All right. Perfect. Let me just hide unnecessary things. Okay, there we go. I'm feeling much more comfortable. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, as Rupert said, I am I'm a landscape designer for Organic Kitchen Gardens, which is a um, a small landscape design company. We still call ourselves Organic Kitchen Gardens because that's where we started. But at the moment, we're doing full-on landscape, both um, ornamental and um, edible plant, working with both edible and ornamental plant material. So one of the things that I love speaking about, and I'm not sure if it's because I love speaking about it, it's because of the things, it's because it's the most often asked um, question is how do I design how do I make my small garden beautiful and and obviously the challenge is because you've got a small space um, but you live in the city you live in the city because it's convenient you live in the city because everything is around you but you know the only thing that's separating you from your neighbor is most of the time just a boundary wall. It's not like in the Buntus where your neighbor is like five kilometers away, you know, and you've got all this space. So how do we design for small space gardens? I'm gonna share some of my tips and some of the things that have worked for me um, when I work with clients and I'm gonna do a very visual representation. I'm taking an example from a project that we're currently working on. And I'm just going to show you what we have proposed for this particular client and, and, and just to demonstrate visually some of these tips and principles that I love to apply. So here we have a construction site, not a garden, just yet. <laughs> We've got a construction site. It's a very tricky space. It's literally there isn't much of a distance between this the side of the house where you see the patio and the boundary wall and very typical of urban small spaced gardens right um and what we then proposed to the client was something sort of like that right you firstly want to be able to extend your your living space. Because again, sometimes you find that the house is also small. It's not just the garden, but the house is also very small. So by creating a patio between the pool and the house, we've already given, given them an extra bit of living space, you know, and this is a particularly special extra bit of living space because it's outside and they're able to get some fresh air, have a view of a garden. We have a small bit of garden on the side and that garden is gonna be, you know, encased in a plant. And it's just because there's such a weird level between the natural ground level and where the patio starts. And here again, it's, you, it, it automatically, give we've automatically given them another room because the most important thing to do when you are creating a small garden is to play the game of optical illusion you want to make the space feel bigger than it really is or at least give the illusion that it's it's bigger than it really is the second thing that we've done here and maybe it's not so visible um is that we have in a bit of a corner here you can see that there are some couches that are sort of protruding at the end of this waterfall, right? So ideally, you also want to create little pockets of space that when you're sitting in the house, they're kind of drawing you out from the house into the garden. So creating a very strong invitation to come outside and chill. You know, when they say garden day, you have your chill <laughs> garden day spot. Um, 
and I mean, it will come up a little bit more clearer in the other slides, but creating a strong invitation to come outside of the house and be in the garden is a very, very important thing when you're creating a small space garden. In fact, any garden, but particularly a small space garden, because you want to feel like you have, you have created a special spot. And that can be, you know, a bench at the end of a small walkway, right? It can be a beautiful piece of art at, at the end of a small passage. So um, creating a very strong focal point is very, very important when, you, when you're doing a small space garden. This is their driveway. Typically, this would be filled with paving from end to end, from the one boundary wall to the other. And then for me, it, it's... <laughs> It, some people love the, you know, the structural concrete effect of paving. It's not something that psychologically I want to arrive to. Like I don't want to arrive home to paving. I want to arrive home to a garden. And most of the time, the challenge we have with small um, urban gardens is that the front is just paving because we have to get the cars in. So what we've decided and proposed is Let's actually soften it. So instead of getting in typical paving, let's get in a grass block. That will at least soften the concrete effects of the paving. We want to be able to ultimately soften the facade of the house, you know. Um, so this gives it a little bit more of a feeling of arriving to a garden as opposed to arriving to another structure. I think psychologically it's more pleasing, it's more calming to arrive to plants as opposed to concrete. The other thing that we've done is we have given them a bit of a water feature in the front and water is such a, an impactful way, not big, but impactful way to create a garden. We didn't need the bonsai, right? We really didn't need the bonsai. Even if we just had the water there, that is the thing that's making a difference. But putting in the, bon the bonsai, again, softens that, that structural bit of the, of the pond. And obviously water is such a delight to come home to. So this, could have been in a small corner somewhere in somebody's um, downstairs duplex apartment situation. And it would have made an impactful uh, bit of garden to look at, to come out, to sit next to, so you can hear the sound of the water trickling down. You can see um, the goldfish in there because this is technically also a a koi pond. So that's the entrance. Again, big paving slabs with grass in between just to soften the welcome home experience, right? Um, this is the, you know, in the previous picture, you saw the end of the pool. And technically here, there would then be, we've suggested like some, a, a small seating area in the corner here. So technically what we've done for them here Again, another small, narrow passageway garden, right? You're looking at this and you're just thinking, but what can this become? And this is what we have proposed. Basically, a long, narrow passageway that we then cut into different rooms, right? That's another way to um, give the illusion that the garden is much bigger than it really is when you can section it into different interesting spaces, right? Each space has a specific purpose. So here, when I said at the end of that waterfall pool, um, you would then be sitting here and looking at the water trickling down. Again, so a nice little spot in the corner there to be able to just lounge, read a book, forget about the day, right? But the other thing that you can do here and that we've done is that we have created some depth with texture. So in a small garden, it's almost like decorating a small room. You wanna go big or go home, right? So we've softened the textures in the planting. We've added a bit of color. We've put the softer textures of the plants towards the back of the garden and then the more bold visible textures towards the front we want the space to feel like it's receding away from us instead of coming at us but also what this creates is a deep rich 
um, sense of depth in the garden. Um, and I guess the other thing that I could mention here is that limit your colors. Kula colors tend to be feel like they're receding as opposed to coming at you. If this was a red garden, it would first of all be a very hot garden and it would be a garden that's constantly coming towards you. So you want the feeling of the garden going back away from you as opposed to constantly coming at you at some height, right? Um, and that's part of creating that depth at some height so that your eye is constantly looking up as opposed to looking in the periphery where you can see the walls coming at you. Because of the heights of the trees, we have literally just kind of raised, it's the difference between single volume ceilings and double volume ceilings. So even though the, the entryway and the, 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 the hallway of the house might be small and tiny because it's got double volume ceiling, it makes it feel much bigger than um, it really is. So yeah, those are my tips for creating a small, um, for designing with a small garden, creates a sense of depth, by playing around with texture, by layering your plants so that you have some ground covers, you've got some plants for color, you've got some plants um, with height, you have different textures of leaves coming in and out, but you also are sticking to cool colors in your color scheme. So, you, you know, your beautiful blue agapanthus, white agapanthus, um, the polysanthus, it's, it's just giving rest, cool. Um, if you're feeling hot, that blue color is the thing that's going to give you the illusion that it's actually not as hot as you think. Um, extend your outdoor living spaces by creating these patios um, and also just soften your concrete. That's really, really important to do when you have a very small driveway and you're trying to create a front entrance garden. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Joy. That's um, a really uh, interesting look. And obviously, for someone like me who, who doesn't think from a design point of view, um, a, a, a good way to to put things about softening and all the rest of it. Uh, the obvious um, question, and and you don't need to answer it, but I'm just saying, has has come up in in the comments, and they they're like. Um, but yeah, it's mostly exotics, but you sl you snuck in the agapanthus there. So um, yeah. <laughs> that's that's so, true. Um so look, there is and 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 it's an absolutely fair question, but I, I and I know you said you I don't need to address it, but I let mm -hmm. me just say something around it, right? Um mm -hmm. and and it's that because I work with different clients and most people are not really that educated or they still have the stigma against um, what is indigenous. I will always try to sneak it in yeah, somewhere, right? Yeah. Because of my own consciousness and what I know it does ecologically for the environment that we are in. And also because... Um, you know, indigenous plants are usually just low maintenance, low water. It makes sense. Mm. No, and I, I think as a, a again as another principle, mm -hmm. rather than trying to beat people over the head with it, sneaking it in is is a a good way of of doing it. So thanks for that. Um, yeah. uh, if you could unshare and um, switch off your camera, and then we're going to move on to to the next speaker. Um, so it gives me a lot of a pleasure to bring on Michelle Milan, who's um, a, also a longtime Botsock contact of mine, actually. We we were together once upon a time um, on the Botsock uh, committee at Kirstenbosch branch. Um, and it, yeah, that's that was more than a decade ago, Michelle, I was looking <laughs> 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 And um, so... Uh, Michelle's someone who's been in academia, um, has done a master's on um, pollination of ericas, which you can go and find on ResearchGate. But um, Michelle these days is trading as a garden coach. So um, 
think given given the bones put down by um, Joy, uh, I'm interested to see how you will fill that in, Michelle. Oh my goodness, I would love to be the person who puts the plants in that garden. I really love the design, Joy, it's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank um, you. So what I'm going to do if I don't spend a lot of time at computers, only Rupert could make me do this. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it works a bit better. And we're going to go there and I'm going to share. Yes. And it's going to work. Perfect. Um, so I am, it's going to disappear there. Okay. First of all, Joy, I think carrying on from that, um, I always feel that one of the most important things in a garden, whether it's a public garden or a personal garden or a garden outside a school or a library or something like that um, is seating. Because gardens you walk through, you don't notice so many things, but when you sit, you start to notice the small things. And for me, that is what's magical, especially about having your own garden, is that you can create detail and you can start to make it a place um, that for many people is a sanctuary. Um, certainly for me, my garden, my personal garden became more important when I stopped doing field work. Um, you know, I had a kid, I had a job, and I couldn't spend as much time in nature reserves as I used to when I was working as a botanist. Um, and then I started to look at the plants in my day zero garden at the time, <laughs> which if you're in the Western Cape, you'll know exactly what that looked like. Um, and say, I'm sure I can make this more interesting. Um, so what I'm going to chat to you today about um, is how to choose those plants, um, with, no matter where in the country you are. Um, and what I'm really excited about at the moment is I think it's with a lot of um, like the uh, social media and um, beautiful new books coming out and access to the internet um, and wonderful organizations popping up everywhere is that um, there's a new generation of indigenous gardeners. When I was a kid, I was gardening with my grandfather and um, my mother. Um, indigenous gardening meant well done, you put an agapanthus in your garden um, and um, a couple of clivias in the shade because nothing else likes to uh, live in dry shade. And if you had something more exciting than that, then, then you were a real collector. Um, but what I love now is we have so much information that's available to us um, that we can now start exploring indigenous gardening in a huge way. Um, ordering seeds from all sorts of places. There are all sorts of wonderful um, specialist nurseries popping up. So um, there's no excuse to have a boring indigenous garden and we can get um, more and more excited about it. So this is about a new generation of indigenous gardening. Um, and uh, I started on this method of gardening and then I found out that it has a name, it's called ecological gardening. Um, and that makes sense as I am an ecologist. What I do um, to, to keep a garden alive, to give you some context, I'm in Cape Town. My garden is on sand um, and we have a water problem. But everybody likes to have a lovely lush garden. And if you go walking on the mountains or in the reserves, even on the Cape Flats, at some point you will get lovely lush greenery in bare, dry sand. Um, and it doesn't make sense. We're all throwing water and throwing compost at these gardens and they're still not looking good. Um, and so the solution to that is to start looking how these plants grow in the wild. So ecological gardening is about paying attention um, to how plants grow in the wild and how the, in the whole system works. So you can think of your garden um, as its own ecosystem and um, ecosystems are really interesting. They've got all these systems within them. So one of them is the soil system, the other is the water system, um, and then you've also got the animals and they all work together. And then the plants are the thing that we kind of add, um, but it's really important if you want to grow an indigenous garden, garden or any kind of garden at all, this works for a food garden too, um, to, to understand a little bit about how these systems work. Um, so, for example, 
one of my big bugbears is people who keep very clean gardens. Um, so they rake up all the leaves that have um, fallen on the soil and they put them away. Um, and um, those leaves and all the little uh, the debris from you know uh, uh, plants shedding bits and pieces is actually really important for soil health. Um, and an extreme example is in forests um, where they sit and they create leaf mold. And that's why forests are very are usually quite uh, nutrient rich areas. Um, but the same happens in a dune system. So, you know, in a dune system, you will always have little hollows where all this plant material um, will blow into and gather. And you'll often find that after rains, those hollows are where seedlings come up uh, because that's a little rich area where the, the plant debris has turned into a sponge. So it's holding water. And these are all lessons we can hold on to um, when we're planting our gardens. So keeping, you don't necessarily have to have rich soil. So I live in a very nutrient poor environment um, and I don't add huge amounts of compost, but I do add mulch um, and that helps keep plants healthy. The next thing is water. So I recently had a client who came to me, she'd moved into a new house and it had acres of paving, absolute acres. And she thought she was doing the right thing well, she was doing the right thing by planting a few planters along a wall and trying to get a food garden going there. But the plants just withered and died because they were stuck between the heat generating acres of paving um, and a wall, which just dries things out. And it's an incredibly harsh environment for a plant. So another lesson to take from um, plant um, communities in the wild is that plants look after each other. So plants breathe out oxygen, but also water. So um, when people are trying to not use a lot of water in a garden, they often plant succulents and have gravel. And the problem with that is, yes, you don't have to water it, but also they don't release a lot of water. So they're not creating a nice environment for other plants. So sometimes the solution in a very dry, very difficult garden is just to stuff lots of plants in it um, so that they look after each other. Um, and then the next thing that is actually really important in a garden for me, and I hope for many other people who are watching this, is the animals. So... Um, the pretty ones like the sunbirds and the butterflies and then the not so pretty ones like the aphids which sunbirds eat and um, and the caterpillars and understanding that these all have a place and me creating places for them um, is really important in ecological gardening and um, everyone talks about creating a balance in your garden of predator and prey and that balance does take a while um, to happen. So if you're growing a garden out of nothing, um, like in these uh, big new estates, it's often really hard to get a garden established because the pests will always find your plants first. Um, and, uh, and then um, it takes a few years for the beneficial insects and birds and whatever to come in. So sometimes that's a waiting game of patience, but also creating an environment um, that those beneficial um, insects and animals want to come into. So this is a picture of my very small garden. Um, and Joy, one of the things you'll notice is a bench. And I, yeah, I think benches are really important or seating areas or areas that you can pause so you can look at what you've got around you and notice what's happening in your garden. And the same, I went on a hike this morning and um, every time I found a rock because I was going up a really steep hill, it was lovely to sit and pause and then to start to recognize the plants. Um, and something that you need to recognize in plants when you're working with indigenous plants is seasonality. So a lot of people who are perhaps not um, well-practiced gardeners, um, plant a garden like they would furnish a lounge um, and they want to put a plant in a place and it must look like that all year and it must look good all year. Um, but it's really important to understand seasonality um, and also embrace it. So uh, this picture is from um, near Springbok in spring, obviously, when everything was lovely and pretty and flower filled. Um, and then a few months later, I went back in summer 
and it was pretty much dry and barren. And I think some people will, if that is their garden, will get a bit bleak uh, because they want color all year round. But I do think if you are gardening with indigenous plants in a difficult area um, where you have a very harsh dry season, what's really nice is to have a bit of a, a shift in thinking and say, you know what, I'm actually gonna embrace that dry season because it's there for a reason. Um, the plants are going to get too hot. Even if I water them, they're just not gonna be happy. You're gonna have a high pest load um, because if it's hot and dry everywhere else and you have a lush garden, um, then all the pests are gonna come to you. So sometimes it's really important to embrace that seasonality and to structure your garden like Joy has done in that beautiful garden that you've got things to look at and spaces to use even when everything is in a bit of a dormant period. One of the ways I love to take advantage of our seasonality is because I'm in the winter rainfall area. Um, I'm okay with my garden looking um, a bit bare in summer when I don't water it. Um, but I love then contrasting that with the incredible range of indigenous bulbs that grow in the winter rainfall area. And in the summer rainfall area, you have summer growing bulbs. Um, and uh, there's no, I feel like there's no point in trying to work against nature with this, but work with nature and say, okay, cool. We're in the winter rainfall area. What bulbs are available? Um, and in uh, winter, my garden becomes a, just a field of pots um, as I bring out my bulb collection from their place in the garage where they've been dormant all summer and the rain waters them. And then it's just, you know, months and months of delight as all these different um, bulb species come up. Um, some are released into the garden when I feel like my collection has, has built up enough. And what's really exciting is more and more of our incredible indigenous bulbs are becoming available for kind of the normal person to buy. It used to just be collectors or you had to know someone, um, but now you can buy them at most nurseries, um, which is really cool. And if you can't buy them at your nursery, ask why. Um, the other thing that you, you could do to make an indigenous garden more interesting is expand your vocabulary. Um, so uh, this is a picture of a plant that I fell in love with last year. I bought one at a nursery and I never saw it again and I lost the label. Planted it in my garden, thought I knew what the name was. Um, I got it wrong, finally found it again this year. It's Athanasia trifurcata. And this, uh, once I found the name, I was able to look it up on Plants Africa, which is an incredible website um, hosted by Sanby, um, and look it up in my plant guides. Um, and then I started seeing it everywhere. Um, like if you buy a red car, you're gonna see red cars driving everywhere. Now I'm seeing this plant growing everywhere. And what is really cool about that is I've seen all the different environments it's growing in. So next to a stream, how it's been used in a garden. And here it was growing in um, an abandoned building site. Um, so now I know that it is extremely tough and can grow without any extra watering in summer. So that's um, those are observations that will be really useful as you start to, if you start to expand your plant vocabulary, A, when you know the name of a plant, um, you can look it up and we have incredible resources to look the plants up with. Um, and B, you, you start to see more detail around you. Another way of getting um, more interesting and local plants in your garden is taking walks around where you live. And we're very uh, privileged in South Africa that there is always going to be an open space. Um, there are not a lot of us that live so far away from any open space. Um, and, but be quite deliberate with your observations and identify the plants. So if you see a nice combination like here, these are two very ordinary plants here, um, this Pelagonium and the Metalasia, but I'd never seen them growing together like this before. And um, here the textures of the soft Pelagonium leaf and the hard Metalasia leaf really were, were fantastic. I, checked my, um, my IDs using iNaturalist. And now this is the plant combination that I know I will use um, in a garden in the area because these were growing wild on the side of the road and they look beautiful. 
Um, so texture, as Joy said, is actually um, really important, especially in a small garden, to add interest. Um, so once you're sitting down on your bench with your cup of coffee, it's really nice to let your eye roam over all sorts of things. And um, I like to use the kind of visualization of when you're planting up a bed, don't just plant one plant in the bed. You want to create a community. So you have the, the overstory, the middle story, and the understory. And these can be plants with a couple of different textures. So when you are going for a hike, have a look at what is growing here. Um, you know, on, on your first glance, glass glance, you might just see the everlastings and think, oh, I want that in my garden. But if you look a little bit closer, you'll see the things that it's growing with. It's growing with a restio. And then there's a little understory underneath it. Um, there's a little lobelia there and a little white fluffy thing that I'm not sure what it is. Um, and if you pay attention to things like that and you kind of class the overstory, middle story and understory in a bed in your head, um, you can pack a lot more diversity into your garden, um, which is also really important in, in creating a garden that supports wildlife. So here's another example of lovely textures. Um, these are two kind of locally indigenous plants to my area. So the Cotyledon, which is very common garden plant, and the Slungbos, which I love until it flowers and it gets brown. <laughs> but um, it's a really nice uh, contrast of textures of locally indigenous plants for, for my garden. And then the last thing is um, pay attention to the edges. So the edges of things are where diversity is highest. Um, so if you think the edge of a forest where it goes out into a sunny um, sunny area is where plants from the forest and plants from the sunny area can both exist, maybe in a little more shade or a little bit more sun um, than they're used to. And then there's a whole another suite of plants that will um, be growing at the edges. And actually our gardens are generally made up of mostly edges. Um, so when you are walking around, if you, as you're transitioning, if you're in, an, in a nature area, if you, as you're transitioning from one kind of um, uh, vegetation type to the other, pay attention to the plants that are growing on the edges. And those are possibly plants that are going to be really happy in your garden um, because they're quite adaptable um, and uh, they, can, they can take a lot of things that are thrown at them. Um, so this is just a summary of the tools that I use just about every day when I'm choosing plants. Uh, so iNaturalist and our wonderful selection of Botsock field guides, Plants Africa, which is a great website. And I really appreciate all the horticulturalists who, um, who write for it. And then in the Western Cape or Cape Town, we have Fainbos Life, which has a wonderful greening guideline where you can look up your, um, your felt type and the Get, kind of get a list of plants that you could use. Um, Cape Farm Mapper, thanks to Rupert, is, um, is a great, also a free online tool. And uh, you can use it to look at a map of where your house is and what kind of vegetation type it would have been um, before you built your house on it, um, which is really nice because then you can start looking at what kind of plants would grow in that, even if you now live in a massive um, housing estate and there is no sign of what was there before. Um, and then my next favorite book is The Veg Bible, which is The Vegetation Types of Southern Africa by M Musina and Rutherford. Um, and that's really lovely because you can look up the vegetation type of where you are and a list of most of the plants that are growing in it. Um, it's not comprehensive, um, but it is very useful to get an idea of, of what would be growing there. And parts of that are available online. I think only the Fainboss bit, um, but Rupert, if you know if any of the other um, bits of it are available online, please let us know. Otherwise you can also buy the book, which is quite an investment, but probably worth it. Um, and that is the end for me. So let's see. If Thanks, I Michelle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the beautiful thing about Sandby publications is that pretty much all of them are available for download on um, on the Sandby website. So if you just Google Sandby publications or the one you're looking for, you should be able to find it. And I can confirm that 
the whole veg map book is available just in the different sections so there's succulent karoo grassland etc um and it's a really lovely thing for everyone to have and if you do want the hard copy i think it is still selling at the botsock bookshops so um <laughs> you can check it out there cool thank you so much michelle um firstly uh if if you could um, answer there's a question in the Q&A about a shade plant um, so you can just answer that by text while we while we, we keep on going um, and there's a really nice comment from um, uh, from Amanda in the wrist um, which I think you will enjoy in the chat okay so um, we're shifting gear again and we're going from Haudbei to Gauteng um, Mulder's Drift to be precise um, Mike, can you switch on your camera, please? Well, I'll, I'll ask you to switch on your camera and unmute yourself. Oh, there we go. Okay, and now I'm going to try something work in terms of just sharing a Blomiki. Uh, that's not working. <laughs> Gotta buy a more blue Mickey down, but, um, at, uh, and I can't unshare. Okay, Mike, continue while I try and sort this out. <laughs> so, um, I uh, Mike works at a uh, random harvest nursery up north, um, and um. It really is a a place worth going to. Ah, oh, there we go. That's what I was looking for. Can you see that, Mike? There we go. Let me keep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Mike's uh, at Random Harvest, and uh, before, like myself, and that's why we've connected over the years, uh, also a conservator down in the Cape. Um, Mike, uh, I've I just want to say something before you start, and and um, this picture was taken two weekends ago in the Macquarland, and it's to tie on to what Michelle was saying about seasonality. You know, it uh, it really kills me every year when people say they just want to go to places for the flower season, and there's this idea of what a flower season looks like, and generally it's fields of one or two things. Um, so this is now middle to late October up in the Macquilland, right next to the coast, and the flower season is over, but we've still got quite a nice display happening. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, th I think given your background um, and the fact that if we think about it here in the Cape and in the rest of the country, we're still quite early on in our, in our adventure towards using lots and lots of indigenous plants in our gardening. Can you give us some of, of your insights and lessons learned so far from, from working in that space? Okay, let's start off with once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> when I was about 10 years old, um, I think when I was 10 years old when Professor Pinar's book came out. Mm. And at that stage, we already had 35 Gauteng bulbs and this is and that is and faith is in the garden. So just always been an inveterate plant collector. Okay, so move forward. Forestry, uh, wadi, wadi, wadi. And yes, if you look at horticulture, which was in place possibly 14, 14, 20, round about there. Everybody gardens. Everybody likes plants. Well, most, most people garden. Most people like plants. Okay, so the conventional nurseries have a happy time because the work's been done for them. You can buy a wisteria or uh, whatever you want, which is exotic. And yet, if you look, if you turn in and you look at South Africa, then there is this question, why not more in ditch? So it's picking up, it's definitely becoming a flavor. The other thing they're doing is... Uh, people almost move into a negative space with exotics. Don't, don't, no more, it's been done. Okay, if it's an acacia longifolia, then don't plant it, it's a declared weed. Otherwise, don't just throw things away because you want to. The biggest problem for 
me because I'm procuring new and exciting stuff for random is that there is no legal base where we can do it. Uh, we've been trying to apply for a, a, a license for cuttings, just not on. I've actually stormed into an office with a handful of cuttings, plonked it on a desk and said, that is a cutting. I mean, 30 cuttings can secure a plant from the felt to the nursery. A sheep possibly eats more than 30 cuttings in one mouthful. <laughs> so the, the escape is you need to meet the farmer and believe me, not all farmers live on their farm. If you just hop over the fence, you definitely are inviting shots. If the farmer happens to be, that's the one that is home, is usually where you hop the fence. So if you get uh, permission from a farmer, you can take cuttings, you can collect seed. If not, you are appointed on silver hills, kudus for them, shout out the silver hills. They, they give us a lot of new species with seed collection. Or you just have to, yeah. Uh, when I drove down from Cape Town, or no, when I drove up, I don't know, I don't know where you drive up or down to Cape Town. When I drove to Cape Town, <laughs> Uh, uh, Mania grandiflora was in flower. And I actually phoned the boss and said, I'm going to be late because I'm looking for seed. <laughs> and it took me one and a half days. I looked at 80 uh, Mania strictors, got three seed pods, and voila, we have, we have plants in the nursery. However, if you look at the strict legality of that, that was illegal because I don't have a collection permit. So there's this quandary of where do nurseries go? And that's something conservation crew and all those people must sit down and we need to find a way out of it. Um, appoint a nursery, appoint a regional nursery, appoint a provincial nursery, I don't care. Allow them to do certain collections or they, they, they need to tell you what they want to collect. And... Uh, then unfortunately they have to follow up and see well okay this guy collected this plant and it's now successfully in uh, cultivation that's the only way we're ever going to get to where the europeans are with their masses of flowers which have been grown for the past 300 years huh. once you have the plant yeah. in the nursery <laughs> excuse me once you have the plant in the nursery it now begins the battle because hmm. it's it's I mean, if you, if you get a feichy from Cape Town, yep, you can drink it and it's something that will grow. But mostly, uh, I mean, the, the Hermanias grandiflora looked very miserable for the first months after they germinated. And then the one thing you need to do, you need to do it, is you need to invest in your soil flora. Soil flora is more important than any nutrient you can ever think of. If your soil flora is not right, forget about gardening. Unless you stick to plant the things that grew in that uh, sterile soil you are in at the moment. Um, I always look at Daimondia margaritaceae, mm. flat little thing. And I, I do a mental shout out to whoever collected that thing the first time. <laughs> because in the felt, it sits in the calcrete hollows near the whip. It is nothing that. I would ever have said that's got horticultural potential. It is just an ugly little thing. You have to realize that A, it is sitting there because that's the only place it can compete. It might not be the choicest uh, uh, site for it, but in the ecology where it is, that is the place where it can compete with the surrounding fainbos and proteas and wadi wadi wadi. Taken out of the uh, little calcrete hollow, it makes a lush little ground cover. So you don't always see potential in the felt. And this is what us, call it horties, same horties do. We get a plant, we taste it. Does it grow? Does it need, does it need mycorrhiza? I, I tell you, you don't grow ericas if you don't have mycorrhiza in the soil. Mm. Uh, if you don't have, there's a company in Durban called EM. They do uh, about 20 soil bacteria. Add that, add molasses to your garden. All helps. And the plant will decide, I want 
that bacterium, that one, and that one, and then I'll be a happy chappy. Yeah. Okay. Not all I'm thinking of gloomy calyx, which is a stunning genus from the Drakensberg, and um, on Dean and them had seed one year. They grew fantastic until the hot days broke and they disappeared off to Hades, boom, all of them within two days. So now we know we actually have to buffer them. They need cool soil. They, they, their roots are not used to uh, warming up. Mm. The moment you have warming up, same thing with Xanthodesia. They're the happiest growers in the garden until you allow your soil to heat up and they just start looking more and more and more stressed, which they are. And then sooner or later, the bacteria tackle them and they disappear completely. So that's more or less what we settle with. What I would ask from, and I don't know who we ask, is we definitely need to sit down and say, uh, I mean, at the same time, sorry, I'm interrupting myself, which is bad. Uh, if, if anybody says, well, I want to grow my meters, uh, which is a guy on Kuchelberg, my meters. Stokoi. Stokoi. Then, I mean, the most he's going to get is a year, right? Because. A, it is a highly specialized environment. The chances that you can mimic that in your garden is absolutely zero. So you also need to use cork in looking at something and deciding, yep, I want to bring that in. Proteasy in general, in Gauteng here, you can plant the Gauteng Proteasy. Uh, there's a few outcrops of sandstone in Magalisburg and, and, and where the Cape stuff grows very well. Otherwise, if you want to see a very miserable denizen, try and plant a protea from Cape Town into red Gauteng clay. <laughs> That's not to happen. Then the other things which we can plumb, seeing your fagis there, is we actually have a hell of a lot of fagis in the Transvaal. Mm. Never as spectacular as yours, but they flower every day of the year, plus that quarter, which we haven't mentioned. Mm. So it's, they are just fantastic. Dilo Sperma is one. I've got a few yep. Dilo Spermas in my garden and they just motor. They, they develop thick tap roots. That in itself presents a problem to the grower in the nursery because you either need to sell a very small plant and get it out and tell the guy plant is going to develop a tap root or you need to put it in a bigger bag like a 10 liter and that stresses the, the client's pocket. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole... You know, it's a whole thing, science, art, money. But the thing we need to do to get South Africa's plants into cultivation is to sit down and say how we are going to do it. So I think I've got some good-ish news <laughs> because if I'm, I've, I've been following um, the South African, um, the new strategy for dealing with the succulent poaching, right? And there are, yeah. there are various subsections to it, but it's definitely been identified that bringing in nurseries as a partner um, is, is, a, is a valuable part of the solution. And um, so I think that could be the little wedge in the wall to open it up to, to other things, because uh, you're right, the, um, the process of applying for permits and also being able to collect, especially with, with what you're talking about opportunistically, is, is a problem. You don't always know where the landowner is or which province you're in or whatever. Um, and uh, there, there needs to be some way of, of um, making that process easier. And um, I'm happy we're starting this conversation. <laughs> so let's see uh, if, if, if we, can, um, we can move it forward. Cool. Um, and then um, I've been up at, at the nursery there uh, at Random Harvest. And do you have any, I mean, how long has the nursery been running for now? Uh, the nursery itself has been 26, 27, 28, almost 30 years. Yeah. So we do know also that nurseries are, are a um, quite tenuous business sometimes, especially with droughts and all the rest of it. What do you think is, has been the kind of secret to the success of Random Harvest? We have seven boreholes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, there's a lot of 
gardens planted in Joburg out, out of random. Mm. And the first thing I was looking at uh, Mark Amia today in somebody's garden. It was still alive and it's hanging in there and it's in the right soil and it has stunning flowers in its life. So the, the one thing with limitations added to it immediately is indigenous is tough. Yeah. Especially if you, more so if you stick to regional. Um, uh, but, but don't stick to regional. I mean, somebody walked into my garden the other day and said, oh, you're such a fantastic plant person and I said well what has just figured you and there was a plant and I said yeah that's the ninth one so you have to experiment which is like that's mm. heavy on the pocket because the guy selling you the plant has tamed it for the bag he now knows what to do um you know to get it out to the to the the, the uh public okay yep. but then you take it to another site and um that's that's where you have to i hope you write with the first try if not you have to try again but that's like and why this conversation is is important is that if people say let's just think let's use kadoxus kadoxus penicius mm. so, i mean there is nothing that can tell you what goes through you when you see a kadoxus the first time in the film yes <laughs> if we don't put in avenues to make kadoxus available to the public the public will steal. End of story. There is no question. Um, it, it, it's just it's just one of those things. And uh, yeah, what can I say? I saw a thing here on seven balls, and no, no, we just have seven balls. We're using one. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got to have insurance, Mike. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question, and and then we're we're going to finish. Um, there's a question from Delia Oersteisen, and she asks, what plant species indigenous to Johannesburg will make good garden plants for a garden in the city? And I'm probably going to say the other thing is, Delia, you probably have to go just visit Mike at the garden. But shortly, Mike, what are a couple of bulletproof plants for? Westpac sells some fantastic plastic plants. They, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Delia, it depends what size you need. Okay, so I, I need sort of height size. We can chat tomorrow. Delia, Delia, and I chat. chat. Mm. Um, so I need to know the height you're on. I need to know what you're going to plant into. Uh, and just to give you an example, we had one client, no names, no pectoral. He bought 40 trees and he came back three years later and he says, Indigenous is rubbish because the plants don't grow. So I said, Well, tell me more about that. And he sat in a pea stone. What is pea stone? Uh, that's where you have high iron levels and your water yeah. up and down and then you get pea stone and usually impermeable layers. Oh, like so the ferric, ferricrete type gravel ferricrete. thing. There we yeah. go. So this guy was on ferricrete, dug a hole as big as the bag, planted them and that was it. <laughs> the, most, the most phenomenal thing was that they were still alive three years later. Mm. But I put on one leaf and I said, why don't you water and feed? And he says, it's indigenous. It doesn't need water. <laughs> so you, you, there, there are a lot of misconceptions, you know, once, once you've got your national indigenous treasure. Mm. So Delia, you and I will chat. You, you can tell me what exactly you want to know. We've got an extensive library of more than a thousand, thousand species. So we'll be able to help you. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, okay. And I just went through, while you mentioned something there about the, um, the Maimitis from, from Kuchelberg, uh, you know, that they, there was a, a pioneer down here, Robbie Thomas, who, who uh, worked out that to grow some of those more threatened Maimitis, you grafted onto a Lucaspermum um, rootstock. Yeah. And right, unfortunately, yeah. um, Robbie passed away last week. He was a, a big um, grower of, of threatened plants and proteaceae and also um, trained a whole generation of horticultures down here so it's important just to think about the contribution of of people like that um cool i'm going to bring everyone else on and i'm going to stop sharing here um joy um michelle mike do you have any questions for each other <laughs> <laughs> me 
<laughs> I would also love a blanket permit so that I can collect plants when I see them. <laughs> yeah, you see, there's that angle to the thing. I'm sure that when nature conservation has applications for permit, the first the first question they usually chuck at me is, what will happen if everybody wants? Well, everybody doesn't want. So we need to control that. So it can't just be a blanket handout. And it needs to be controlled also as to the success of the guy you give the permit out to, because if he uh, consistently botched things up, then no, you can't have a permit. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but, so you, uh, need, you need training wheels. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, but given... Uh, Okay, we in year four, we have almost visible Buffon disticas now. Okay, they are slow as hell. But given a Buffon at, let's say, 100 Rand, a four liter bag, the risk of uh, going out into felt and stealing one, they come to the nursery and they're quite happy to pay the money. And then now I've got a plant that I've always wanted. So there is a, I don't even want to go anywhere of uh, ex, ex situ conversation, ach, conservation, uh, because yeah, 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 if it happens, it happens, but it's like eating kale because it's healthy. It's like, no, it, it must just automatically happen. It's, it's not, you can't go and collect plants and say, I'll, I'll conserve them. That's, that's a bit dull. Yeah. If you look at iSpot's uh, 20 most threatened plants, my God, 19 of those will do fantastic in horticulture. So, there is a situation where you're going to have them. Uh, I'll give you an idea. Uh, I don't do Facebook, or I do the first five posts on a morning when I wake up. And there was a uh, Lopesha of Maria Lopeshiri Jr. Yes. And he posted a pot of Lopeshiri, which was now the previous year. Be careful now, because 50% of the people on the school actually have combs now from, from Lopesha Jr. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I just posted there. I said, hell, I would like a handful of those things. And two weeks later, with the courier arrived, a handful of bulbs. So he, so we started chatting and he said, it is my, it is my vision to make Maria Lopeshiri the most abundant Maria in the country. So it's not <laughs> endangered anymore. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk. Cool. Oh, we must talk. Yes. Joy and, and Michelle, any um, cross-examination for each other? Um, look, <laughs> maybe not, not cross-examination, but maybe just to, um, you know, the challenges that have been spoken here are, are real. Um, you know, Mike is speaking from the heart, but also from everyday challenges. And it's challenges that... Um, landscape designers, all, all of what he's saying trickles down to, to gardeners, to landscape designers, to garden developers, to, to all those people. And the frustration we have is that we know we have beautiful plants, but you, we get to the nursery and like, yeah, no, this is a lovely plant, but it's just not something that is in production. Um, yeah, this could be really good, but it's it's not something that's available. Or, for example, in routing, we have we have random harvest. I think we have maybe about a handful, right, of um, in pure indigenous growers. So it's it's just, I suppose the the comforting thing is that um, it's nice to hear that this is not a unique thing that it is actually something that's being brought to the fore and it is something that is being considered um at the highest level so yeah not not a not a cross-examination but just a um a sentiment of relief some there is it's being noticed it's being done something about yes it is being a challenge but it's not a challenge that's that's gone unnoticed I think this is where we, as um, people educated in indigenous plants, where, um, and especially if you are putting in gardens, so I do a lot of plant purchasing for my clients. And um, 
as you said, I sneak in the indigenous stuff sometimes. In fact, actually, it's always my first choice. Um, and if they have an absolute request for something that's not indigenous, I honor it. But um, I like to introduce my clients to new plants that they've never seen before because they're not in house and garden. Mm. Um, and uh, I think we we have power as people who buy a lot of plants and who interact with nurseries to say, this is the plant I want to find. And the people viewing this who are hopefully growing indigenous gardens, they have the power to go to nurseries and say, I want to see this. And hopefully that will trickle. You can't, um, <laughs> unless you have lots of very dedicated um, specialists who are happy to grow plants that are still obscure, um we can't uh, create availability of our incredible variety of indigenous plants in commercial nurseries if there's no demand and so that's why i say you need to you know in increase your um the range of plants that you have sitting in your head um because if you go to a nursery and you ask a nursery man what you can put in your garden that has color at the moment they will probably offer you a petunia mm. um, and that's because that's what most people are familiar with <laughs> um, but we here have the power to make them familiar with felicia filifolia which is in full flower at the moment along um, the roadsides near me um, and which is available in nurseries but it's stuck at the back in the indigenous section Mm. Um, which is not often at the front. And that's another thing um, that, you know, we have the, the power to start asking for. It's like, why, when you go into most big commercial nurseries, are the petunias at the front and the indigenous plants at the back? <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same reason the sweets are at the aisle as you, as you leave. <laughs> it's a quick <laughs> fix. <Yay. laughs> Okay, thanks, uh, team. Um, you know, we could have this conversation for several hours, but uh, we, we need to uh, get to dinner and that sort of thing. So I just want to thank Mike, Joy, and Michelle for your contribution. Um, if people are keen on finding them, um, they're very easy to find. Uh, well, Mike's not on Facebook much, as he said, but Random Harvest um, does have an online presence. Uh, Michelle, Instagram mostly. Um, what's your handle again? Uh, sun and soil sun and soil and joy as you said organic kitchens um organic kitchen gardens organic kitchen gardens yeah okay so thank you very much um if you can switch off your cameras i'm just going to do a couple of announcements for botsock but uh i really appreciate you guys um okay you, oh, you're welcome mike good so um I've got some exciting news. Um, we've uh, some of the botan the botanical site society will be um, doing some outreach on the eastern uh, Cape Coast. Um, so uh, next week, Wednesday, um, at Kuleja Botanical Garden, um, the new uh, conservation um, project manager Martina Trienicht will be out there um, along with Nomama May. So. That's uh, fantastic. Keep an eye on the Botsock social media um, platforms like Instagram and Facebook to see where else they'll be. And then, ta -da, um, at the end of next month, um, we've got uh, the 2023 edition of the Great Southern BioBlitz. And um, you can see that we've, we're starting to go Pan-African. Um, so uh, from all the way from up north in Gabon, Nairobi, through to down in Cape Town. Um, so if, if like me, you like to travel to take part of these uh, in these bio blitzes, uh, you've got a range of options. Um, and if you're new to iNaturalist, uh, there are also a set of tutorials that will be um, running um, weekly. So starting from next Wednesday, uh, so just keep an eye on um, iNatureZA on Facebook or the Botsock or Crew social media platforms. Okay, so thank you for sticking by so much. Uh, uh, we went a little bit over time, but I think it needed to. And um, just want to remind you of next month's um, 
webinar, which is the last one for the year. Um, we, we're also going back to indigenous foods and seeing um, basically from how to grow them. And hopefully we can, we can also learn how to eat more of them. And uh, one of your presenters, there's a cryptic um, clue there. So uh, be sure to tune in next year. I mean, next week, <laughs> next month, excuse me. And um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I've been Rupert Gopan presenting this on behalf of the Botanical Society of South Africa. And um, go ahead and enjoy your garden month. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe. Goodbye.